a lavender study guide and begin with our opening paragraph. It says, the United States is unquestionably the most powerful nation on earth today. More than this, it is the most powerful nation that has ever existed in the history of the human experience. This political, economic, and military potency has caused many to inquire what role, if any, the United States would play in Bible prophecy. This is precisely the question we will seek to answer in this lesson. And so our presentation is entitled, Discover the United States' Amazing Role in Bible Prophecy. And as we've already said before, in the future, the final issue of loyalty will center around what, everyone? Center around the issue of worship. So let's look right there in our study guide. Some of this is review from last night's material. It says, worship or what? Worship or else. The word cause. And let's go to Revelation chapter 13 for this. This is actually how we began last night's presentation. But let's just go back for just a little bit of review as we prepare to understand the United States' amazing role in Bible prophecy. I'm in Revelation chapter 13, and we'll begin in verse 11. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 11, when you're there, say amen. amen. John says, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence. And what's the next word? causes the earth and those who dwell in it to what? Worship. Notice verse 15, down toward the bottom it says, and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. First part of verse 16, and causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or in their foreheads. And so this word cause is an important word here in Revelation chapter 13. It occurs three times. How many times, everyone? three times, so that's what you'd write right there. And the word cause means to force. In this context, the word cause means to force. Every time the word cause is used there in Revelation chapter 13, you could just substitute the word force. And he forces them to worship. And he forces them to worship. He compels them or causes them to worship. In context, it's clearly against their will. It goes on to say, we might ask the question, does God ever force people to worship him, yes or no? Absolutely not. We've given you two texts there, Matthew chapter 11 and Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 3. Both of those texts and, and a host of others, literally scores of others, could be cited from both the Old and the New Testaments in which God invites us and draws us and asks us to worship Him, but never ever forces us. If that makes sense, say amen. So we go on. God urges, invites, encourages, woos, and draws us to worship Him, but He never forces us to. Forced worship like forced what? Love is a contradiction in terms and is surely rooted in Satan's perverse and insatiable desire for worship. And yet that's exactly what we see there in Revelation chapter 13 is that this power would seek to force, to cause, to compel worship. Forced love has a very ugly word attached to it. We call that word rape. We don't, we don't believe that love can be forced. In fact, I've given the illustration, I think, in this room before. If I held a gun at you like this and I said, I want you to stand up, you would stand up. If I held that same gun at you and said, I want you to turn around, you would turn around. If I said, I want you to stand on your head, you would do your best to stand on your head. And I said, I want you to bark like a dog. You'd burp, 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 if you really thought I was going to do you harm. But if I pointed that very same gun at you and I said, love me with all your heart, could you do it? Yes or no? Love cannot be forced. Say amen if that makes sense. Worship is nothing more and nothing less than the extension of our love to God. Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. And if love cannot be forced, worship, true worship, cannot be forced. Can you say amen to that? So now we're to the mark of the beast there, the second subheading in your study guide. It says the mark of the beast, let's say it all together, is the mark of the beast. And that's the point. You've got it. It's not the mark of the beast. One word. It's the mark of the beast. That is, it is the beast's mark of authority. We have identified from the Bible the beast as none other than the Roman church state. Incidentally, some of you have said, wow, that's so amazing. I've never seen that before. That's so cutting edge. You must be on the cutting edge of what's happening in Revelation, David. Absolutely not. not. Look at the rest of this. It says, uh, this identification is consistent with essentially every one of the Protestant reformers. Tell me if these names mean anything to you. From Martin Luther and John Wesley to William Tyndale and John Calvin. Do those names mean anything to anyone in this room? 
okay? Every one of those people believed what I've been teaching you about the identity of the beast of Revelation 13 and the little horn of Daniel 7 and 8. Every one of them, this is not something new. As a matter of fact, this is something old. It's something what, everyone? Old. So don't think that I invented this. Hardly, hardly, hardly. Now, it doesn't matter. Just because somebody taught it in the past doesn't mean it's true. Can someone say amen? In other words, we, d we don't say, well, if it was taught in the past, if it was good enough for them, it was good enough for us. What we say is, is it based on what the Bible teaches? Can you say amen? And in this case, they were right in their identification. Now, I know that there are many people who are waiting for some antichrist figure, a single man to appear at the end of time amidst seven years of tribulation who's going to be some kind of incarnate satanic figure. Beloved, that is not the antichrist presented in the Bible. That might be an antichrist presented in some fictitious action series called Left Behind, but that is not the antichrist figure depicted in the Bible. At least that is not what historic Christianity has taught, and it's also not what the Bible teaches. Teaches. Let's continue on here. It says, the mark of the beast then would be the mark of the Roman church state. So we identify who the beast is, and then we ask very simply, what is the beast's mark? If the beast is the Roman church state, then we ask a very simple question, what is her mark of authority? And we looked at this last night. This is from C.F. Thomas, a letter dated October 20th, 1895. Other sources could be given, incidentally, but this one is so clear. It says, of course, the church claims that the change, that is the change from the biblical Sabbath to Sunday, the pagan Sunday, was her act. And the act is a what? Mark of her ecclesiastical power. And what's that word? Authority in religious matters. And so we simply identify the beast and then we say, hey, what's your mark? And they say, our mark, our proof that we can change religious dogmas and teachings and laws is that we change the biblical day of worship, one of the Ten Commandments written with the finger of God on tables of stone and was placed in the ark. We can change it. And that's the claim. That's the claim that's being made there. So notice there, bottom of the first page, it says, last lesson we learned that the mark of the Roman church state's authority in religious matters is found in her presumptuous claim to have changed the Christian day of worship from Sabbath to what, everyone? Sunday. This is her amazing claim. Uh, this is her claim, and it is an amazing one indeed. Well, where did we get this idea from that this change would be introduced? We saw it as one of the identifying characteristics of the Antichrist in Daniel chapter 7, verse 25. See if you remember it, where it says that he would think to change times. And who remembers? Laws. That he would be so presumptuous, he would actually think he could change the very times and the very laws, not of Sterling Heights, but of God. Now, is that an amazing claim, everyone? Yes or no? Absolutely. You're right there at the bottom of the first page. Remember Daniel 7.25, which says, This anti-Christian power will think to change the very times and laws of God. Have they attempted to do this? The answer of history is yes. They have sought to transfer the holiness and solemnity of the seventh-day Sabbath to the first day of the week. There is no what kind of authority for this? Biblical authority or mandate for this change. We've already been over that. If you're new tonight, that's review. In fact, all of this so far is review. The church has done it out of her own sense of authority. She has placed convenience and tradition above the what, everyone? The Bible. The Roman church state has historically made this claim and continues to make this claim even today. She claims that this change proves her sovereignty and authority in religious matters. It is a mark of her authority. It is a mark, an identifying mark of the beast, and it's usurped ecclesiastical power. Now, I think it's only fair, once we've identified the beast, that we go to them and ask them what their mark of ecclesiastical authority is, and they tell us without equivocation. And you might be thinking to yourself, do you mean to say, David, that you believe that this day, this new day of worship that has been introduced, not on the authority of the Bible, but on the authority of the church and tradition, are you saying that that day is going to be legislated and enforced? And that's exactly what I'm saying. In fact, a friend of mine, uh, G. Edward Reed, he's a lawyer. He wrote a book entitled Sunday's Coming, Eye-Opening Evidence that These Are the Very Last Days. The evidence is mounting. There is an increasingly strong movement to, what is that word, everyone? Legislate Sunday observance. And you say, that's absolutely, positively impossible. I'm going to do my best tonight to demonstrate to you that not only is it not impossible, it's probable in our modern political climate. And the Bible says that it is absolutely going to happen. So let us continue here. This was a slide we put up last night. And I want to just sort of walk you through it. 
About six years ago, uh, Pope John Paul II introduced an, ex an encyclical letter entitled Dies Domini, which literally means in Latin, the day of the Lord. It means what, everyone? The day of the Lord. And uh, it was big news because he basically was dealing with the whole idea of Sunday and its theological significance. It was an encyclical letter. And uh, very, very interesting, some of the text of that letter. I've read the text in its entirety. You can find it on the Internet. I'd recommend you do the same. Just type that in, encyclical letter, DS Domini. You can do it right into any Google search engine. But this was very interesting from the Detroit News, dated Tuesday, July 7, 1998. Pope John Paul is issuing a stern warning to Catholics that they should set aside what? Sunday for worship. You say, well, of course, of course Catholics should set aside Sunday for worship. But let's, go, let's see what he goes on to say. He went on to say that a violator of Sunday should be what? Punished as a what? Heretic. Now, beloved, I want you to think about that for just a moment. What's happening is, is that there is an agitation surrounding this idea of Sunday. There's a what, everyone? An agitation. In fact, there's, there's a whole alliance here in the United States of America and the world over called the Lord's Day Alliance. You can look that up on your internet if you'd like. The Lord's Day Alliance. And there are people who are saying we need to get this nation back to God. We need to get it back to who, everyone? God. And they make a very uh, persuasive case. They say, we've abandoned God in the schools and we've abandoned God here. And many of the Christians are saying, that's right. We've abandoned God. That's right. We need to get back to God. And one of the things they say that we've done is we've begun to desecrate God's holy day. And they begin to talk about how we need to get back to what that holy day that God set aside. And they even call it the Sabbath. They call it the what, everyone? The Sabbath. But guess what day they're talking about? Yeah, they're not talking about the biblical Sabbath. They're talking about this new day. And so this is actually taking place. I'm going to give you more on that in just a moment. So in Revelation chapter 13, I will actually, first of all, go here to your study guide, and we're going to work our way toward Revelation chapter 13. Notice the paragraph there that begins with the word impossible. Impossible. Now somebody says, are you saying that every single person that goes to church on Sunday today has the mark of the beast? Number one, have I said that? Yes or no? No. And I wouldn't say it. Because there are faithful people who love the Lord Jesus Christ who are living up to all of the light that they have and God will only hold us responsible for what we know. If you believe that, say amen. James chapter 4, verse 17, For him that knows to do good and does it not, to him it is sin. However, if you know to do good and you don't do it, that is a, whether you're talking about the Sabbath or anything, that puts you on dangerous ground. What kind of ground, everyone? Dangerous ground. So if I know that I should not be stealing, but I continue to steal, that could potentially fracture my relationship with God. Is that true? Yes or no? Of course, of course, of course, absolutely. So the idea here is simply this. If we know what's right, if we know what's true, if we know what's biblical, God says, I've revealed truth to you, not because I hate you, but because I love you, and I have the expectation as one of my disciples that you will follow what the Bible says, not what tradition says. Someone say amen. And we quoted that yesterday in Matthew chapter 15 where Jesus says, In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of what? Do you remember? The commandments of men. That's exactly right. Now somebody's going to say, Oh, well, David, I already keep the Sabbath because I go to church on Saturday. Notice I didn't say anything about going to church on Saturday. There's a big difference between going to church on Saturday and keeping the biblical Sabbath as God intended it. Beloved, listen, there's many people that go to church on Sunday and they can't wait for the sermon to get done so they can get home and watch the football games. Now tell me if I'm telling the truth now. Come on. Oh, sure. Now I'm not saying that's everyone. Of course not, of course not, of course not. But there's a big difference between just going to church and keeping a day holy for the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? Well, you know, what does it mean to keep the Sabbath holy? Beloved, I'll tell you what it means. It basically means three things. Number one, you don't work. So whatever it is that you're doing the other days of the week, you don't do on that day. Number one, you don't work. Number two, you don't cause others to work. That's what the commandment says. The stranger that is within your gates, you're not causing them to work. Number three, whatever activity you're engaging in on the Sabbath, it's drawing you closer to God. Can you say amen? And so any other secular activity that you might do the other six days of the week, think of the Sabbath as a date with God. As a what, everyone? as a date with God. And if someone invited you over and said, uh, you know, your, your spouse uh, before you were married or if you're not yet married, you have a date with someone. If they come over to your house and you have a certain time and you're going to do a certain activity, you say, okay, we're going to go out and do that, but first I've got to change the oil in my car. 
And then after I change the oil, I got to mow the lawn. And then after I mow the lawn, I got to trim the weeds. And after I trim the weeds, I got to put fertilizer. All of these things you got to do. Are you going to end up having a date? Yes or no? Absolutely not. So the Sabbath is all about a relationship. It's all about what, everyone? A relationship between you and your Creator, Jesus Christ, between you and your Redeemer, Jesus Christ. It's a weekly date with God. If that makes sense, say amen. And so, beloved, there's a huge difference between just going to church on Saturday and keeping the Sabbath. If that makes sense, say amen. It's important to understand the distinction there. Now, now let's continue on here. Impossible, you say. That would never happen. I mean, it's impossible to even suggest that this would ever be enforced here in this free, liberty-loving country of the United States of America. Be careful. Note that 36 states in this union already have Sunday laws on the books just waiting to be enforced. They're called blue laws. They're called what, everyone? Blue laws. You go type that into Google. Just do a little research on blue laws. 36 out of 50 states in the United States of America already have these laws on the books. These aren't laws that have to be passed in many cases. These are laws that simply have to be, guess what? Enforced. That's exactly right. The climate is ripening for just this kind of thing. Many a politician and many a religious leader are keen on, quote, getting this country back to God. I mean, beloved, people aren't blind. They can see the moral decline that's taking place. They can see all of the things that are happening in society and the, the gross debauchery and the gross moral decline, the gross moral chaos that's taking place. People can see it. And in reaction to that, we have politicians and religionists and even religious leaders saying, we need to get this nation back. Back to what? God. Now, I believe we need to get this nation back to God, but here's the major difference in the way that you do it. In the what, everyone? In the way. I believe we should do our very best to get this nation back to God. And do you know how I think we should do it? By doing what we're doing right here, by preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Someone say amen. In other words, this idea that we're going to get everybody in the legislation to become Christians and we're going to start legislating our ideas and legislating our beliefs. Whoo, you better be careful. You'd better be careful because church and state never make good bed partners. See, we got this whole people, all, everyone's like, we need to get the more religion back into, the, into the, the government, et cetera, et cetera. Now listen, I believe we should have godly, moral people in government, but we need to be very careful that that line is not crossed where people are enforcing their religious beliefs on others who may not believe those beliefs. Are we with it? Are we together, everyone? In fact, if you want to look at this, it's actually very simple from a biblical perspective. There are how many commandments? Ten commandments. The last six commandments deal with the relationship that you have with those people around you. Honor thy father and thy mother. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt, thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. And you shall not covet your neighbor's goods. All of those have to do with the horizontal relationship. Are we together, everyone? Yes or no? The government absolutely, totally, completely should enforce those things as civil parameters and civil laws. If you believe that, say amen. And we don't want to argue for a, an anarchy or any kind of thing like this. We need civil restraint. And Paul talks about that in Romans chapter 13. But the first four commandments, the civil government has no business. Has what did I say? No business enforcing. I mean, are we comfortable with the United States government enforcing thou shalt have no other gods except the Jehovah God? Absolutely not, beloved. Uh, you're forcing worship if you think that's true. Are we comfortable with the, with the United States government enforcing the second commandment? Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above the earth, beneath of the waters under the earth. Are, does that, do we want our government telling us how we should worship? See, one of the greatest rights that we have in the United States of America is the right to be wrong. Can you say amen? It's the right to be wrong. And neither should they be enforcing taking the, names, uh, the name of God in vain. And neither should they be enforcing the Sabbath. And so it's actually a very simple distinction. You can find it in Romans chapter 13. The Apostle Paul says, God has set up governing authorities. And then he quotes from the commandments. But he doesn't quote the first commandment. He doesn't quote the second commandment. He doesn't quote the third commandment. And he doesn't quote the fourth commandment. Because Paul knew that this is not the proper sphere for a secular government to be enforcing. If that makes sense, say amen. We're going to get into that here in just a moment. People want to get the nation back to God. The problem is, is that they're going to overstep their boundaries. They're going to go too far. See, governments tend to be reactionary. It's very unusual that a government just nicely comes right back to the middle. Whoop, they're like a pendulum and whoop, back this way and whoop, back that way. So let's look at our study guide here. 
It says this mixture of church and state is always a dangerous mixture as the 1,260 year period known as the what ages clearly reveals. Dark ages. Why, the, why do they call it the dark ages? Because the lamp of God, the light of the word was taken away. The First Amendment of the Constitution is a safeguard against this very kind of thing. But the Constitution is being radically, what's that next word? Reevaluated. Re We're going to talk about that in just a moment. The climate of the United States right now, post 9-11, is a very different world than the pre-9-11 world. Is that true? Yes or no? Absolutely. The world will never be a same, the same again, neither will the United States. We are living in strange and portentous times as the increasing number of politicians and legislators claim that they are Christians on a mission to turn this nation back to God. And I want to say again, nothing wrong with wanting to get this nation back to God. But beloved, you didn't see Jesus out protesting the abuses of the Roman government. You didn't see Jesus out protesting the abuses of the, 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 uh, Herod and the others. Jesus preached the gospel. Amen? And that's what Christians are called to do, to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, not to legislate their views on people who may or may not hold to those very views. We're going to come back to that in just a second. So look at the bottom of that page. To put it very plainly, I don't know how to make it more plain than this, Sunday observance will be legislated. This will be the enforcement of the mark of the beast. We've already have identified the beast. We've already identified the mark of their ecclesiastical authority. And so the enforcing of that must be the legislation of that mark. It's really quite simple. The transfer from the biblical Sabbath to Sunday is the beast's mark. This mark will be caused or enforced. The United States will play a pivotal role in this enforcement as Revelation chapter 13 makes clear. Now I want to say something here as we turn to the third page of our study guide. Someone in this room is bound to say, oh really? I wonder if that's true. In fact, it looks like the biblical evidence actually points in that direction and I'm going to wait and see. I'm going to wait and see how this pans out. And I'll tell you what, if it ends up happening that way, then I'll know that Pastor Ashrick was right. I'll know that his interpretation was correct. And then I'll start to keep the Sabbath. Beloved, I got news for you. The Bible says today to keep God's Sabbath. Can you say amen? See, it's not just an end time issue. It is an end time issue, but it's also a biblical issue, if that makes sense. Say amen. Let's just pretend that the mark of the beast had to do um, with the second commandment, not bowing down to image. Let's just pretend for a moment. So we say, well, I'm going to keep bowing down to my images, and in case they pass that law that says I can't do it, then I'll change. Is that how we should go about it? Yes or no? Absolutely not. Beloved, if you open your Bible today, you will find that in Exodus chapter 20 and in Deuteronomy chapter 5, the Sabbath commandment is there today. You could go check on it right now. It's not just going to suddenly appear at the end of time when these things become agitated. It's there today. So it's not just an end time issue. It's a present tense current events issue, but it will also become an end time issue. If that makes sense, say amen. By the way, we should never, ever, 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 ever delay to obey what we know is God's will. Amen? And, and that does, it doesn't have to be the Sabbath. It could be anything. It's never safe to wait or to delay. If you believe that, say amen. Okay, so let's go. The two beasts. Who is the second? I'm in Revelation chapter 13. For those of you who are attentive Bible students, you have noticed that there are actually two beasts in Revelation chapter 13. How many beasts, everyone? Two beasts. Let's begin in verse 1. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 1. John says... Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his head a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a what, everyone? Leopard. His feet were like the feet of a what, everyone? Bear. His mouth was like the mouth of a lion. And who gave him his power throne and great authority? The dragon. And who's the dragon? Satan. Okay, this is the Antichrist beast. I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And how much of the world marveled and followed after the beast? All the world. Verse 4. So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Verse 5. And he was given a mouth to speak great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for how many months? 42 months. That's 1,260 days. That's the three and a half years that we've already talked about. Those dates that move from 538 A.D. to 1798 A.D. of papal persecution. It goes on. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. It was granted him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will what, everyone? 
worship Him. That's the key issue. Whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. Then verse 10, He who leads into captivity will go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be what, everyone? Killed with the sword. Here is the patience and faith of the saints. Now look at verse 11. Then I saw what? Another beast. So we know who that first beast is. We have plainly, clearly identified from the Bible this first beast as the Roman church state. If you believe that, say amen. amen. So look at the top of uh, page 3 in your study guide. Revelation chapter 13 describes how many beasts, everyone? Yes. Two beasts. The first beast rises up out of the sea. And how many horns does it have? Ten horns. It has the body of a leopard. It has the feet of a bear. It has the mouth of a lion. This imagery, of course, comes from Daniel chapter seven as we have already seen in study now i want you to notice the sequence john sees this beast in this order first he notices the horns that would be on the beast that represented rome are we all clear there and then what did he see after the horns what did he see next he saw the body of a leopard okay and who who was the leopard everyone greece that's right and then he saw the feet of a bear and that was who meat of persia and then he saw the mouth of a Lion. So from John's perspective, living in the time of Rome, he saw in this order, he saw this beast's characteristics as Rome, Greece, Medo-Persia, Babylon. If that makes sense, say amen. Now, how did Daniel see them? Daniel saw them in the exact what? Opposite order. What did he see first? Lion, and then he saw the bear, and then he saw the leopard, and then he saw the beast with ten horns. Why might that be? Beloved, because John was living during the time of Rome and he was looking backward through history and Daniel was living 600 years before the time of Jesus and he was looking forward into the future. If that makes sense, say amen. Absolutely powerful. You can fill that in right there. Why the difference? Daniel was looking forward into the future. That is, he was looking prophetically. John was looking backward into history. That is, he was looking historically. The first beast is the Roman church state, as we have already seen. Who is the second beast? We know who this guy is. We've got, we have that first beast in our sights. We have spent message after message after message after message identifying that rascal. We know who that is. But now another beast was seen coming up. What was coming up, everyone? Another, so there are two beasts here. There are two beasts. The first beast is, is, as we've already identified, the Roman church state, which reigned for 1,260 literal years, that is prophetic days, from 538 A.D. We've been over this. This is all review. 1,260 years to exactly 1798. In 1798, a man by the name of Berthier, one of Napoleon's top generals, marched into the Vatican. He took the Pope off of the throne, declared everything there as the property of France, and the Pope died in exile, and the deadly wound was inflicted. The what was inflicted? That agrees perfectly with verse 3, where it says his deadly wound was healed. And so a deadly wound was inflicted. We could perhaps spend some more time on that. So we know who this first beast is. But here's something very interesting. There is a second beast, and this beast acts as the spokesperson for the first beast. Now, beloved, what is a beast in Bible prophecy? Okay, it's a kingdom or a nation. That's exactly right. So here we have Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. So a beast in Bible prophecy is, a, let's say it together, a kingdom. So here he sees another kingdom coming up. There's a second beast. This beast is sometimes referred to as the false prophet because he speaks on behalf of the first beast who claims to be God. Think about it. A prophet speaks for who, everyone? For themselves? No, 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 no. A prophet speaks for God. That's why you find so many times in the Old Testament, thus saith what? The Lord. Thus saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, and others. And so this second beast comes up, and he basically speaks on behalf of that first beast who actually claims to be God on earth. That's why he's called the false what? Prophet. prophet. You've got it. Now, let's look at this. Verse 11. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke like a dragon, and he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence, and he causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the what? The first beast. So notice the job of the second beast is to cause the earth to worship who? 
the first, not himself, but the first beast. You've got it. Causes all who are in it. It says in verse 13, he performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men. He deceives those who dwell on the earth by the signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. He was granted power to give breath. Notice that. He gives breath. The word is pneuma to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. He causes all. No one is exempt, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or in their what? Foreheads. And we learned last night that you can get the mark of the beast in either your right hand or your forehead, but the seal of God, you can only get what? In your forehead. Why the difference? Because you can't work your way to heaven. Someone say amen. You're only getting to heaven by faith, and so the seal of God can't be put in the hand. The seal of God can only go in the forehead. If that makes sense, say amen. Powerful. It goes on here. It says here, what verse am I in, everyone? You remind me. Verse uh, 17. And that no one might buy or sell except the one who has the mark of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. So the job of this second beast is to cause the earth to worship and to reverence the first beast. If that makes sense from the chapter, say amen. Now we know who the first beast is. Now we've got to figure out who's the second beast. Okay, you're right there in your study guide. We're going to look at six identifying characteristics. How many characteristics, everyone? And they're all going to come from the Bible. How many are going to come from the Bible? I'm not going to stand up here and say, well, you know, it could be North Korea. And it could be the former Soviet Union. No, no, no. Let's look at what the Bible has to say. And we'll see that the Bible interprets itself. If you believe that, say amen. Now, I want you to notice, first identifying characteristic, this beast rises out of the what? Earth. He rises out of the earth. Okay? He rises out of the earth as opposed to the what? Sea. sea. Now, we've already seen in Revelation and in Daniel that water in Bible prophecy represents what? Peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. That is a populated, populated or populous area. So this beast is seen rising up in a very different locale. The other beast in, in Revelation 13 rises out of the sea. This beast rises out of the what, everyone? Rises out of the earth. So look at the board here. We're going to ask five simple questions. We're going to look at five considerations. Where does this power arise? What is the governmental character of this beast? When does this power arise? How does this power arise? And we're going to take a look at the global influence of this power. And in looking at these five things, what we're going to see is that it's actually very easy to identify this beast. So our first question is, where does he rise out of? The earth. Now look at number two. The Bible says he has two horns like a what? Like a lamb. Now the New Testament uses the word lamb 29 times. 26 of those are directly from the book of Revelation. And every time, except one, it's a reference to guess who? Jesus Christ. The only time it's not a reference to Jesus Christ is this verse right here, verse 11. The only time in all of Revelation that the word lamb is used and it's clearly not a reference to Christ is when it says he has two horns like a lamb. This means that this beast would espouse lamb-like or Christ-like characteristics. If that makes sense, say amen. What did John the Baptist say? He said, behold the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And so this beast rises up out of the earth. The first beast rose up out of a populated area. This beast rises up out of a relatively unpopulated area. That just makes sense. If the sea is a populated area, then the earth would be a less populated area. So he rises up in a different er area. He also, uh, as we've just discussed here in number two, he has lamb-like characteristics. He has what, everyone? Lamb-like or Christ-like characteristics. Look at number three. The first beast had horns with crowns. Does the Bible say anything about the second beast having crowns, yes or no? No. So we might ask the question, who wears a crown? Okay, uh, you've got it. A king wears a crown, or a pontiff wears a crown, or a queen wears a crown. Does a president wear a crown? Presidents don't wear crowns. This, the governmental character of this beast would be different. We're not going to look for a royal or a kingly or a queenly authority. So notice it says, Horns have no crowns. There is no king or queen in this beast, whoever it is. Number four says it rises up about the same time the first beast goes down. Let me show that to you. You're right there in verse 10. What verse, everyone? So John is seeing this first beast and he's watching it do its various rampages and ravages. It's doing its, its uh, mission there. And then he sees it receive the deadly wound. 
Okay, 1798, we've already talked about that. In fact, if you want to just do a little bit of history, here's essentially what happened. Uh, among other things, Napoleon got fed up with the Catholic Church. That's basically the short version. And he sent one of his best ger generals down there, and he said, I'm tired of that rascal. Go down there and just take care of business. And so it received a deadly wound. It received a what, everyone? Deadly wound. So look at verse 10. It says, he who leads into what? Captivity will go into what? Captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and faith of the saints. And so what was happening basically during the period of the Dark Ages is that if you wouldn't bow to the Roman church state, you could be led to captivity, led to a dungeon, led to a prison, or killed. And what John sees here in vision is that this power that's been leading into captivity will himself go into captivity. This power that's been killing with the sword will himself be killed by the sword. And what's the very next thing John sees? Verse 11. Then I saw what? Another beast coming up out of the what? Earth. So get this in your mind. It's actually very, very simple. John sees this first beast on its career, 538 to 1798, and he sees it go into captivity and get wounded by the sword. And just at about the time he sees this beast going down, he sees another beast what? Coming up. So now we have a time element. Now we have a time element. The first beast received its deadly wound in 1798. And so we're looking for this nation to come on the scene of action sometime around 1798. Okay? That's number four. Look at number five. It says, if you look at verse 11, I saw another beast. What are the next two words? Coming up. Do you see that? Revelation chapter 13, verse 11. I saw another beast. What is it, everyone? Coming up. That's exactly right. Now, it's very interesting here. The Greek word translated coming up is the very same word that is used to describe the almost invisibly slow maturation of a growing plant. Any gardeners here? You put that seed in the ground and you wait. Nothing, you wait. Nothing, you wait. Nothing. And then just one day, you look and there's the, the dirt has moved slightly and you got a little something there. And then you go away for a week and you come back and it's just a little bigger. You go away for a week, you come back, it's just a little bigger. It's coming up slowly, almost imperceptibly. It's coming up slowly, almost what? Imperceptibly. That's the word that's being used. That's actually what the word means. He sees another beast coming up. So this beast, unlike, say, these beasts here, right? Remember the bear, I, you might remember back in Daniel chapter 7, the bear, it said, arise, devour much flesh. And he had those three ribs in the mouth, signifying the three provinces of Babylon that he had conquered. This second beast is nothing like this. This beast is not pouncing and conquering other nations. This beast is growing quietly, slowly, almost imperceptibly, in a relatively unpopulated area of the world. So we can't be looking for this beast to come up in the old world where, where all of the other beasts came up and the sea was and the populated area was. This beast is going to come up quietly, imperceptibly, almost like a plant growing. Not conquering, but coming up. If that makes sense, say amen. And then look at number six. This beast would eventually possess unprecedented global power and influence. I mean, you say, how do you know that? Well, look at the text. The text says several times that he causes the whole earth to worship the first beast. Now, I'm just looking down here at my good friend, uh, Maurice, who I love very, very much. And Maurice is from Cameroon. I'm going to just pick on you very quickly here, Maurice. Not pick on you, of course. I love you like a brother. But we can be pretty sure that whoever this nation is, it's probably not Cameroon for a variety of reasons. If, 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 if Cameroon passed a law and said the whole world has to do something, you think they'd listen? They'd say, uh, uh, unfortunately, Maurice, you know, here in the United States, we're not as good in our geography as in other places. A lot of people would say, Cameroon? Is that some kind of a nut? <laughs> right? A lot of people wouldn't even know. So this, this, this nation, whatever this nation is, has to possess global influence. If that makes sense, say Amen. Okay, so here's our identifiers right here on the board. Okay, this is what we're looking for. This is the second beast. How many of, the, how many of these identifiers came from the Bible? Oh. Every one of them. So number one, it arises in a relatively unpopulated area. Number two, it espouses Christ-like principles. Jesus said things like, If the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. In Luke chapter 4, Jesus said that, that He had come to preach liberty to the captives. This nation would espouse Christ-like principles. Number three, this nation will not have a king 
This nation would not have a queen or any kind of a monarchy. This would be a nation that was ruled governmentally differently. Number four, this nation has to arise sometime around the time the first beast is going down, which was in 1798. So we're looking for a beast to come up sometime around 1798. This nation is going to grow up quietly like a plant, not primarily through conquering other nations. And number six, this, this beast would eventually grow to have unprecedented worldwide power and influence. Now, is there any question in anybody's mind who we're talking about here? I mean, it is just as plain as the noonday sun. Who is this second beast of Revelation chapter 13? It could only be the United States of America. Let's see if it meets all of the identifying characteristics. Did this country arise in a new area, a relatively unpopulated area, as opposed to the old world? Absolutely. Does this country espouse Christ-like principles, at least in, in concept and in principle, yes or no? Absolutely. Not always in practice, but at least in principle. Number three, is there a king or a queen here? In fact, the exact opposite. When the Pilgrim Fathers and others landed here, they decided, our, our forefathers, we're going to talk about this in a moment, that they would start a government not with subjects, but with citizens. Did you hear what I said? There's not going to be a king that's reigning supreme over the lowly peasants. But we would have, instead of a, a kingdom with peasants, we would have a citizenry where people could, a government, let's, let's say it this way, of the people, for the people, and by the people. Oh, that's a little different, isn't it? It would arise around what? 1798. Does that fit? The answer is yes. Does it grow up quietly like a plant, not primarily through conquering other nations? Absolutely. And has it grown literally? I mean, almost overnight. Think about it this way. The United States of America is basically only 200 years old and is the most powerful nation that has ever existed in the history of the human experience. I mean, it just literally just who came on the scene of action. And now, uh, as a good friend of mine from Romania says, my wife is from Romania, he says, when the United States sneezes, the whole world gets a cold. Isn't that right? And I could give you instance after instance after instance of this thing. For example, the United States says, hey, listen, we want to invade Iraq. And the UN says no. And they say, tough. Now, we'll do whatever we want. It's like the old uh, saying, where does an 800-pound gorilla sit? <laughs> he sits wherever he wants to, right? And so uh, Tony Blair uh, from the, uh, uh, the uh, United Kingdom and a few others have figured this out. They've said, you know what? He's the toughest kid on the block. Better join him. That's exactly what's happening. Now, let's go through and see if this all fits together. This is from the New World Compared with the Old by G.A. Townsend. Notice what he said. The mystery, speaking of the United States, the mystery of her coming forth from vacancy like a silent seed, we grew into a what? An empire. Oh, that's exactly the biblical language. Like a silent seed coming up slowly, almost imperceptibly. Daniel and Revelation by Uriah Smith, page 578. Emerging amid the silence of the earth, adding daily to its power and strength. So it fits that qualification very nicely. The founding fathers of the United States fled political and religious tyranny. They had been in the old world where they had seen that religious tyranny and political tyranny basically got them nowhere except persecution. If you didn't have the luxury or the fortune of being born into one of the royal families or somehow being associated with royalty, you could be in a very bad way. And so when they landed, I, you know the stories, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but they would get off those boats and they would kiss the ground because this was a new place where they didn't have to worry about the king saying thus and so and the pope saying thus and so. It was a new land where they could try a new governmental experiment. experiment. And I believe in my soul of souls that God opened this nation up right on time. I believe that with every fiber of my being. Does it meet the time element? Absolutely. The first constitutional convention was convened on May 25th, 1787. Is that around 1798? Yes or no? So just as the one beast is going down, what's the other beast doing? Coming up. And the Declaration of Independence was signed July 4th. Say it with me. 1776. So one is going down and one is coming up. Meets that specification perfectly. The Declaration of Independence. I love this. We hold these truths to be what? Self-evident. That all men are created what? Beloved, do you know how revolutionary that is? 
I mean, we take these things for granted here in the United States of America. That is so revolutionary. I mean, beloved, in the old world with, with the royal hierarchy and the oligarchies of kings and queens and princes, not everybody was created equal. I mean, to even suggest that the peasant was the equal of the king is laughable. And here they say, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men, of course, including women as well, are created what? Equal, that they are endowed by their what? Creator with certain unalienable, that means cannot be taken away, certain unalienable rights that among these are, say it with me, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Just a little bit of hedonism thrown in there at the end. A few of you got that. United States Constitution, the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of what? Religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. As George Thorogood Marshall said, your rights end where my nose begins. Can you say amen? Hey, you're right. You can do whatever you want, but your rights end right at the very place that my nose begins. If that makes sense, say amen. So in the United States of America, if you want to worship that pulpit, you want to start a whole religion where you worship that pulpit, and uh, you want to dance around the pulpit and say, this is the creator God, this pulpit here. Could you do that in this country, yes or no? It would be foolish. It would be illogical. It would be uh, unusual, but you could do it. Amen. Absolutely, that's the point. You see, they were so under the thumb of religious and political tyranny that when they got on these new shores, they said, we're tired of the popes and we're tired of the kings. Amen. So they established this radically new government. I mean, it was an experiment. It was, a, it was, it was the American experiment. A government of the people, for the people, by the people, where everyone is equal and citizens vote leaders. I mean, we take this for granted now. This was radical, beloved. Absolutely radical. What makes this nation great? Two central freedoms, two central liberties make this nation great. Civil liberty, that is freedom from a king, and religious liberty, that is freedom from a pope. If you want to be even more technical, you'd say republicanism and protestantism. Those are the two principles that make this nation great. Republicanism, sometimes we think we live in a democracy, but really we don't live in a democracy. We live in a republic, which is a representative democracy. We pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. A republic is a representative democracy. The idea of republicanism is that the people can govern themselves. If you believe that, say amen. We don't need kings. That doesn't say that sometimes our presidents have not acted that way, but I'm saying in principle, in principle in what, everyone? And we don't need popes. We can worship how we want to worship in this country. We have the right to be wrong. Someone say amen. amen. Absolutely incredible. So religious liberty is freedom from a pope. Civil liberty is freedom from a king. Look at George Washington. Who could have said it better than this in 1789? Mr. Washington, first president of the United States of America, said every man conducting himself as a good what? Citizen and being accountable to who? God what? Alone for his religious opinions ought to be protected in worshiping the deity according to the dictates of his own good conscience. Can you say amen? So now no one's going to come and say, you'd better bow to the cardinal, you'd better bow to the pontiff, you'd better bow to the prelate. Mr. Washington said, we've had enough of that. You can worship God according to the dictates of your own good conscience. You want to be a Protestant? You can be a Protestant. You want to be a Muslim? You can be a Muslim. You want to be a Catholic? You can be a Catholic. You want to be an atheist? You can be an atheist. You, what, as long as what you do does not infringe upon my rights, where your rights end, my nose begins, you can worship God according to the dictates of your own good conscience. Amen. Beloved, that is one of the things that makes this nation great. I'll say it again. It's the right to be wrong. Mm. Look at this one, Benjamin Franklin, I love this. Whoo! When religion is good, it will take care of itself. So, so, one amen out of that. Mercy. When religion is good, it'll take care of itself. Amen. amen. Now look at this. When it is not able to take care of itself, and God does not see fit to take care of it, so that it has to appeal to the civil power for... Support. Benjamin Franklin said, it, it's evidence to my mind that the cause is a bad one. You see what he's saying? Beloved, that's exactly right. 
That's exactly right. Religion is good. It'll take care of itself. But the moment that the religious entity has to appeal to the civil entity for support and for money and for finances and for influences, he said, listen, if God can't support this thing, why, pray tell, should the secular government support it? Amen. Whoo, founding fathers. It says that this nation would speak like a dragon. Look there in verse 11. I wish I could stop here. I mean, I wish it was a happy story and we all marched off into the great democratic uh, horizon there, you know, uh, you know, behind the drummer. and I wish it could end like that. But it says something very disturbing in verse 11. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth and he had two horns like a what? A lamb. So he would espouse Christ-like principles of liberty and freedom, but... Eventually, he would speak like a what? And who's the dragon? Satan. Let me tell you something. That is the only verse in all of Scripture where the word lamb and the word dragon appear in the same verse. That's it. There is a tension in this verse that is palpable. I mean, here you have the lamb and the dragon mentioned in the same verse. Whoo! Would speak like a dragon. Well, we might legitimately ask the question, how does a nation speak? Through its laws and legislative what? That's how a nation speaks, through its laws and legislative body. The Bible predicts an erosion of freedom when church and state unite. You say, how do you know that? Because I just read that the second beast is going to cause, is going to what, everyone? Cause the earth to worship the what? You're saying impossible. That's absolutely impossible. No, it's not impossible. In fact, the deadly wound is healing right before our very eyes. That first beast is growing in power and in preeminence right before our very eyes. In 1929, Mussolini sat down with Cardinal Gaspari and signed the historic Roman Pact. I want you to notice the language here, February 11th, 1929. The Roman question tonight was a thing of the past, and the Vatican was at peace with Italy in affixing the autographs to the memorable document, healing the what? Healing the wound, extreme cordiality was displayed on both sides. Isn't that interesting? I could give you, I could give you three other articles, uh, contemporaneous articles that say that exact same thing. When they sat down together, and basically what happened was that Mussolini turned civil power back over to the Vatican. He gave it back over. He basically reestablished the Vatican as its own civil governing entity. They were healing the wound that had been inflicted in 1798 by France when they took the Pope off his throne. Is that interesting, is it or not? Oh, they began to heal the wound, and it is being healed right before our very eyes today. And uh, this man was probably the single greatest evangelist and apologist that the church had ever seen, traveling all over the world. And he was, he was almost like a rock star in some ways. Malachi Martin, who wrote the book, The Keys of This Blood, he was a Jesuit. He said this, willing or not, ready or not, we are all involved in an all-out, no-holds-barred. I want you to look at this word right here. What's that word? three-way. We'll come back to that. A three-way global competition. Most of us are not competitors, however. We are the stakes. For the competition is about who will establish the first one-world system of government that has ever existed in the society of nations. It is about who will hold and wield the dual power of authority and control over each of us as individuals and over all of us together as a community. He's saying we're the stakes. There's a three-way battle. A what battle, everyone? Three. You can read the book. It's, you don't really even have to read the book. Here, was his, here were the three, the three C's that in Malachi Martin's almost thousand-page book were struggling for the supremacy. Capitalism, that is the West. Catholicism, that is the papacy. And communism, that is the Soviet Union. Now, beloved, you know that that's an older book, don't you? Written in the 19, uh, late 1970s, early 1980s. You know it's an older book because how many of those C's are around today? Yeah, just two of them. One of them's gone. And you say, well, I wonder how that happened. How did the one disappear? I'll tell you how it disappeared. The other two got together and got rid of them. Time magazine, right on the front cover, Holy Alliance, that's Pope John Paul, that's Ronald Reagan. So the moral superpower of the world and the greatest superpower of the world, the subtitle says, how Reagan and the Pope conspired. How Reagan and the Pope what? Conspired to assist Poland's solidarity movement and hasten the demise of what? communism. So I want you to think about that. In the 1980s, there were three players. In the late 1970s, early 1980s, when Malachi Martin wrote The Keys of This Blood, there were three players on the scene. Capitalism, communism, and Catholicism. And two of them got together and kicked the other guy off the bench. And it was so common knowledge that they put it right on the front cover of our major news media magazines. Now, I want to ask you a question. Does that sound at all like what Bible prophecy is saying, yes or no? A coming together of the greatest superpower in the world and the beast of Revelation chapter 13. 
absolutely incredible. And you just have this, uh, this man just going out, just basically bringing the whole world together. He has died, and his predecessor has come on the scene. He's already in dialogues with Islam, and everybody says, oh, he really made the Muslims mad when he made that comment. <laughs> Beloved, let me tell you something. Even though the Muslims were upset, and they were all mad at the Pope, and people were going crazy, etc. Et you remember this yesterday? I mean, this is like, what, two, a month ago, two months ago? I want you to notice something. When it came time to settle the score, when it came time to sort it all out and to have the meetings and to sit down over tea, you know where they didn't meet? They didn't meet in Afghanistan. They didn't meet in the Middle East. They didn't meet in Islamabad. You know where they met? They met at the Pope's place. That tells you who's got the power. When it came time to settle it, they met in Rome. Where did they meet? And at the end of the day, everybody was happy again. And oh, we have so much in common. See, beloved, it's happening. Look at that right there. The most powerful men in the world kneeling before the body at the funeral. That was the first time in history that a United States president had ever even attended a papal funeral. First time in history, beloved. And it wasn't just one. You have the current president. Uh, w, George W., you have the former president, George Bush I, and Bill Clinton, and Jimmy Carter would have gone, but there were, uh, I believe, medical complications. Three presidents, Condoleezza Rice is just there, Tony Blair's just outside of the picture, the most powerful people in the world kneel. Look at what they're doing, beloved. They are kneeling. What are they doing? They're kneeling before the Pope, the dead Pope. Now, beloved, if, if that doesn't tell you something is up, there's a rat in the wood pile, you're not paying attention. I saw a bumper sticker one time that said, if you're not concerned, if you're not outraged, you're not paying attention. Beloved, look at that. The wound is healing. The wound is what? In fact, for a long time, the United States of America wouldn't even send an ambassador to the Vatican. But Ronald Reagan changed all that in 1984. He was the first president in the history of the United States to send an ambassador to the Vatican. And ever since then, we've had an ambassador to the Vatican. What's happening is the wound is healing, and these, this great moral superpower, the uh, uh, Roman church state, is aligning itself with the great military and political su and economic superpower, I might add, the United States of America, and they're getting closer and closer and tighter and tighter. If that makes sense, say amen. It's happening. It's front, it's front news headlines, beloved. You keep your eyes on it. I'll come back to that one another day. How was the Roman church state formed? It worked through secular governments. This is right there in your study guide. You look at the last page. Last page. How was the Roman church state originally formed? And here's what we're going to do. We're going to continue this on Thursday. Amen? Beloved, listen, because we still have to go over the 666 thing. Now, I'm going to tell you something. As God is witness, I had total intentions of going over the 666 thing. In fact, I could fast forward on my slides right now. You'd see it right on the slide, ready to be presented. But I need to be sure that we're all moving along at the same pace and we're all getting it. Amen. Is that responsible? Yes or no? It's very important for me. I know it's like drinking out of a fire hydrant, okay? And, and, and that's just the way I am. <laughs> Beloved, because I'm, I'm passionate and I believe this is Bible truth and I believe that, that we need to be making daily stands for the Lord Jesus Christ so we don't get swept away in this mob mentality that is fast coming. Can you say amen? Because, Beloved, at the end of the day, it's all about Jesus. Amen? See, at the end of the day, it's all about Jesus. If you choose to worship the Lord Jesus Christ and to keep His commandments by faith, you can't get the mark of the beast. Amen? But don't tell me it's not going to be extremely helpful to know at the end of time what the issues are. Amen? You see what the issues are and it's beginning to become increasingly clear.